You're watching Bread and Roses, a weekly political social magazine that's broadcast in English and Persian via New Channel TV. Hello everyone, I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Faribos Puya. In this week's program, we'll be discussing violence against children. We'll interview Farida Arman, a children's rights activist. Shocking news of the week will be from Afghanistan and the acquittal of the man who incited Farkhonde's murder. The insane fatwa of the week is from Malaysia and how even non-Muslims should dress piously. And urgent action of the week is uh, regarding Atena Daemi. And our good news for this week is Suhail Arabi's execution has been cancelled. We'll be responding to a, reader, uh, a viewer question again, which is on why we've called our program Bread and Roses. We've got a new segment too called A Slice of Life and because it is Ramadan, we'll tell you some Ramadan jokes too. Stay with us. According to UNICEF, of every 10 children in the world, one lives in a war zone. A child is killed by violence every five minutes with most of these deaths occurring outside war zones. Those living in poverty are more likely to be victims of violence. Millions feel unsafe in their homes, schools and communities. Child victims of violence have brain activity similar to soldiers exposed to combat and more than 30% are likely to develop long-lasting symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. Only 41 countries have an explicit ban on violence against children. We need a safer world for children today. If we look at the statistics that the majority of children are being killed outside of war zones, I think it does really become very shocking indeed in the fact that children in their daily lives, in their schools, in their homes, in their communities are facing, you know, an epidemic of violence really. Yeah, I agree. And a lot of these um, statistics, well, it's not, it doesn't show the violence and effect of it, the negative impact on children doesn't show itself in the statistics. Um, a lot of children live in an environment that there's violence against women, but that we don't see that anymore. And also, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that aren't included in the statistics as violence, but in a way they are. I mean, religious indoctrination, for example, is a form of psychological violence, in my opinion, or child veiling, for example, is a form of abuse. A lot of these statistics, if you look at it, you know, I think the, um, it's the, the level of violence, both psychological and physical, is truly immense. Yes, and also partly is the growth of religious organization and religious propaganda and religious you know, states uh, that uh, um, encourage really violence against children and create a situation for, that, for, the, for violence against children to be justified. But apart from that, we live in a society that the situation is constantly rep has been reproduced, that uh, environment that children are subject to really, really harsh conditions. And I mean, there's, it's interesting because even in countries where you find that there are, you know, stricter laws in defense of children, let's say in Britain with the Ch Child Welfare, uh, the Children's Act, you do see still nonetheless that there's very little money put into child protection. So there are incidences of child violence and uh, violence against children sure. to an extent that really shouldn't be happening. And we'll, we'll see a lot uh, good policy uh, some, sometimes we see pockets of brilliant activities and action in defense of children, but these are only pockets of good policy, good practice. When you look at overall, in, even in European society, you see that underlying violence against children, which is very closely linked to violence against women. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one of the things that's interesting too is that when we look at the question of violence, it's just not physical. Uh, if you look at the statistics, a lot of the violence takes place, for example, in the cyber cyberspace, and it's a form of cyberbullying. So it, it is good to see the, 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 you know, the various forms of violence against children. But, you know, on the point that Fibor's made on the fact that so much of violence against children is also linked to violence against women, we're now going to be seeing an interview that Fibor's did earlier with Farida Arman, who's a campaigner for women's and children's rights, about this 
uh, aspect of violence against women, how it affects children so very deeply. Stay with us. فریده آرمان به برنامه نان گل سرخ خوش آمدید. مرسی متشکرم از اینکه منو دعوت کردید. میخواستم در رابطه با کتابی رو که اخیراً منتشر کردین در رابطه با خوشونت به اهل زنان در سوئد با ما صحبت کنیم. انجمن ما که اسمش هستش انجمن حقوق زن در کشور سوئد یا انجمن سراسری کتابی رو منتشر کرد که این مصاحبه ای هست با 11 تا زن که مورد خشونت واقع شدن و در مورد خشونت پنهان پنهانی که وجود داره نسبت به زنان و بچه ها در این کتاب این مصاحبه صورت گرفته و خیلی این کتاب مورد توجه قرار گرفت برای اینکه اون چیز اون حرف های ناگفته این زنا از طریق این کتاب بیرون اومد و به گوش جامعه رسیدش ف... یک جنبه ای ام... که کار شما توجه کرده بهش مسئله وضعیت کودکان در این قضیه است و اینکه شما تو این مسئله چه کارا کردید یه چیزی که به نظرم خیلی شاید بهش بی توجهی میشه یا کم توجهی میشه مسئله کودکانیه که شاهد شاهد خشونت هستن به ویژه خشونت تو رابطه نزدیک یعنی پدر یا پدر مادر رو میزنه و این بچه شاهد این هستش و تو اکثر خانواده هایی که خشونت نسبت به زن وجود داره خشونت نسبت به بچه هم وجود داره و آسیبی که ولی یه آدم بزرگ میدونین خیلی میتونه راحت تر از پس یه ماجرای بر بیاد از یه مشکلی که وجود داره بالاخره یه آدمی که شکل گرفته فکرش جسمش همه چی شکل گرفته ولی یه بچه هنوز داره شکل میگیره و این قضیه یه همچین خشونتی و یه همچین وضعیت ناامنی میتونه تو تمام زندگی آینده این بچه تاثیر بذاره و و این این بچه ها خیلی به شکل عجیبی یعنی خیلی از اینا میبینین خودشون تو بزرگی خودشون خشونت به خرج میدن نسبت به رابطه ای که دارن یا دست به خودکشی میزنن دچار بیماری های روحی میشن و کابوس میبینن و یه مجموعه مشکلاتی هستش که این بچه ها دارن و جامعه خیلی حداقل تو جامعه سوئد وقتی من دارم میگم که من خودم توش زندگی میکنم امکانات زیادی برای دادن به کمک به زنایی که مورد خشونت واقع میشن وجود داره و این زنا دست بچه‌شون رو میگیرن و میان توی این خونه های ام بدون اینکه خیلی توجه بشه به وضعیت این بچه ها چه بلایی داره سر این بچه ها میادش این موضوع که سعی کردیم ما بهش توجه کنیم و توجه جامعه هم بهش جلب کنیم جامعه سوئد نسبت به این وضعیت کودکانی که در محیط خشونت دار در واقع بزرگ میشن برخورد میکنن چه سیستم و عکس العمل نشون داده یا اینکه امکاناتی دارن بله. این ظاهرا خیلی توجه میشه ظاهرش ولی بیشتر وقتی نگاه میکنید تو عمل چون من خودم توی ارتباط نزدیکی هستم با خونه های امن سازمان ما خونه امن نداره ولی بیشتر سعی میکنه به زنانی که تو خونه های امن هستن بعد از اینکه اون قدم رو بر میدارن که همسرشون رو به پلیس رجوع کنن یا به مراجع دولتی رجوع کنن و بگن شوهرم منو میزنه بعد از این مرحله کمک هایی که صورت میگیره اینطوری که اول زن رو سعی میکنن ببینن اگه بدنش آسیبی دیده زخمی شده یا بالاخره دست باش شکسته چیزی اول بهش کمک درمانی بدن و بعد از اون خونه درش بیارن ببرنش به یه جای امنی که مخفیه و مرد نتونه بهش دسترسی پیدا بکنه اگه زنه شکایت بکنه که خب شاید مرد هم ببرن دادگاه و پلیس و بالاخره زندان و این چیزا ولی این وسط میبینیم مادر دست بچه رو میگیره از اینجا به این از این خونه به اون خونه از این وضعیت مادر حالش خودش خوب نیست به خاطر اینکه بالاخره یه آدم تو ترس زندگی کردن آسون نیست خیلی فشار روحی زیادی میذاره آدم همه زندگیش به هم خورده خونه از زندگی همه چی بعضی اوقات اونایی که مورد خشونت ناموسی قرار میگیرن حتی اینطوریه که از خانواده خودش از فک و فامیلش تمام روابطش حتی کنده میشه یعنی یهو یه زن میمونه ایزوله با بچهش و یه جامعه که نمیشناسه و غریبه از توش و این خیلی سخته این فشار مستقیما به بچه و به رویه بچه منتقل میشه تازه خیلی از این بچه ها نه تنها شاهد خشونت بودن بلکه 
خودشون هم مورد خشونت واقع شدن از طرف پدرشون اینا و اینجاست که جامعه سوئد توجه خیلی زیادی نمیکنه به این بچه ها و سازمان ما سعی کرده این خله رو یه جورایی پر بکنه و ما خونه هم گفتم نداریم ولی سعی میکنیم این بچه ها یه دار این دوره سخت رو با یه اکتیویته و با یه فعالیت هایی به راحت تر از سر بگذرونن رابطه شون با مادرشون خوب بشه مادره یه استراحت و یه فعالیت هایی بکنه که یه ذره وضعیت روحی خودش خوب بشه که بتونه مستقیم تاثیر بذاره روی بچه خیلی از بچه هایی که با مادرشون میان پیش ما که از خونه های امن هستن بعد از اینکه مورد خشونت واقع شدن اینا میبینین میدونین بچه بدنش مایچاش میگیره دستاش پاش گرفتگی مایچه پیدا میکنه به خاطر این فشاری که داره دل درد و سردرد یکی از معمول ترین سیمتوم های عوارض این ناآرامی بچه هستش و خوابای ترسناک دیدن تو شب داد زدن فریاد زدن بچه احساس ناامنی میکنه همش چسبیده به مادرش به هیچ کس اعتماد نداره و همه چی یعنی این 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 پروسه ادامه پیدا میکنه این وضعیت اگه آدم تو به موقع بش نرسه و من چیزی که من میخوام بگم اینه که چه به مادرایی که مورد خشونت واقع میشن اگه صدای منو میشنون چه به کسایی که در کار میکنن با زنایی که مورد خشونت واقع شدن و یا ارتباطی دارن اینی که توجهتون رو و فوکوستون رو بذارین روی بچه بچه هیچ کی رو نداره به جز ما بزرگا بچه هیچ کمکی نداره اگه ما بهش کمک نکنیم این این شونه‌های کوچولو باعث این بار به این بزرگی رو هم بکنه و زیرش خم میشه زیرش خورد میشه و این وظیفه ما هاست ما بزرگاست انجمن هاست نهاد هاست اکتیویست هاست و تمام نهادهای دولتی در درجه اول که زیاد توجه نمیکنن متاسفانه ایران که وضعش خرابه اصلا به زنی که مورد خشونت واقعا میشه کمکی نمیکنه اون باید اصلا اول رژیم رو سرنگون کرد تا بعد آدم برسه به اینکه حقوق زن و بعد حقوق کودک رو بتونه بگیره از این بالاخره بهش دستیابی پیدا کنه ولی توجه همه باعث به نظرم خیلی فکوس بشه به این بچههایی که تو این وضعیت هستن میگم یه اتفاقا یه آماری من خوندم خیلی جالب بود گفته بود که روی 500 تا بچه توی 10 سال که مادرشون در بر اثر خشونت خشونت مرد به زن فوت کرده بودن این بچه ها اکثرا یا خودکشی میکردن یا دچار بیماری های روحی شدید میشدن میگم یعنی حتی تو بزرگ سالی این باشون میادش ببینین این خیلی تکون دهنده است به نظر من به عنوان سوال آخر و کوتاه فکر کنید تاثیر کتابی رو که شما چاپ کردین عکس العمل جامعه به شکل واقعی چی بوده جامعه سعی میکنه یعنی اولا میگم این کتاب خیلی منتشر شد تو روزنامه ها تو روزنامه های مختلف رادیو های سوئدی و تلویزیون سوئد چه با من چه با دستان کارای این کتاب مصاحبه کردن و میگم یه صدایی از درون بود این کتاب یه صدایی بود که شاید شنیده نمیشد قبلا الان جامعه اینو میشنوه و موظف نسبت بهش واکنش نشون بده سازمان ما تونسته خیلی محبوبیت زیادی کسب بکنه و ما پروژه هایی که میدیم برای کمک به این زنان و بچه ها اکثرا با موفقیت پیش میره و خیلی زنایی که تو شرکت میکنن خیلی تاثیرش رو مستقیم میبینن سازمان های زیادی هم دارن میخونن این کتاب و امیدوارم بتونن جامعه توجه بیشتری بکنه بهش با تشکر از شرکتتون برنامه نانگال سرخ مرسی خیلی ممنون An Afghan appeal court has quashed a decision, an earlier decision of death penalty for four men who have been punished for their role in the mob murder of Farkhonde. It's been reduced to 20 years. I personally am happy that the death penalty isn't taking place. But nonetheless, what's most shocking and outrageous is the fact that the um, shrine keeper that actually incited the mob violence by, by, by accusing Farkhonde of committing some sort of act of blasphemy, he's been acquitted. And the interesting thing is, he's been acquitted behind closed doors. Nobody knew this. So even the lawyers, the family, 
they were not informed, they were not present when the decision was made. Behind closed doors, they suddenly decided this guy needs to be released. And that's the shocking part of it. Interestingly, when there was a lot of international attention to the case of Farquhar, there, there was public hearing and you could see the pressure and they, they had to act. Now the cameras moved away, they are doing what they normally do. Mm -hmm. They actually is no justice. Well, what's what's of course great about this case, as well as it being, you know, a huge tragedy, is the sort of resistance that we saw in Afghan society, and also the resistance of of the family. Her brother, for example, has come out and said that they just will not accept this judgment. It's not justice, and that they want to see justice, you know, uh, in in her case. And what I think is is also added that um, this is a show. This is a theater, they're just acting. They were acting for everybody and, and behind closed doors now. But the reality is that what's happened behind closed doors is a normal practice in Afghanistan, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia. Behind closed doors, there's no justice in the Islamic sort of judiciary system. Uh, if you actually have public, open public, even in Sharia courts in Britain, if you have public um, hearing, that the cases are discussed, everybody would be outraged and this decision would not go down. Nobody would accept these things. The only reason they can do it is behind closed doors where the eyes of public are, is not on it. Yeah, I mean, I th think the reality is that these sort of religious courts are so fundamentally unfair and so unjust. And it's usually, you know, there, there are so many cases where, you know, a woman who's been raped has had to marry her a rapist, you know, a woman who's been um, assaulted is, uh, you know, is pregnant from rape, she has to be stoned because it's an act of adultery and so on and so forth. There's so many instances of injustice and it's clear why so many people in countries under Sharia law are contesting it, are challenging it and opposing it. And I think this case is one that we need to continue to highlight. Don't forget that immense resistance in defense of Farkhonde that exists there today. And we've got to side with those dissenters and campaigners against the Afghan Sharia system um, and, and demand justice for Farkhonde and for women in Afghanistan. A mufti in Malaysia has stated that non-Muslims should dress modestly as a way of respecting Muslims because they don't want to see, you know, women's awrats, which is, as Faribor says, the naughty bits, out in public, out there, even though you've got clothes on and you're walking, you know, down the street, quite respectable, doing your business as usual. They don't like to see it because... It's that imagination of theirs. And, they can't. And the definition of naughty bit it changes. Yes. So it could be uh, your breasts. Definitely could, the thighs. The thighs are big, big time <laughs> part of your the naughty part. Your arms. Yeah. Your neck. Your hair. Your hair. You know the <laughs> your eyes. Legs. The eyes. The eyes have it. <laughs> I think that that's what it is. I think they're scared of this. I mean, but the other sort of the dark aspect of this um, fatwa, apart from the funny part of it, <laughs> is. Um, that they are imposing it on supposedly non-Muslims. So this is the next step. It's, 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 always, it's always interesting, like this, isn't it? yeah. It's well, as long as they've got slight power, they yeah. extend it. And when they come to power, it's compulsory for everybody. For everybody, yes. right. And that's, I think, the trick that they play, isn't it? They start imposing it step by step, uh, making it, you know, it's just they, they always, and, and usually it's women are targeted. And I think Every society should see that when women are being targeted and their aurat is being targeted. And they start, they start talking about the <laughs> thighs. You watch out because be you're next. You're yes. next. <laughs> so, you know, again, ridiculous. We all have to dress modestly because, you know, they don't want to see us because we're forbidden to them. Well, shut your bloody eyes. Don't look if it's so offensive to you. But this is how people actually look, you know, everywhere. Now this week's urgent action, it's from Iran. We want to bring to your attention the case of Atana Daimi, a children's rights activist who was arrested in October 2014 last year and recently been sentenced to 
14 years imprisonment. And 14 years in prison because she attended a protest for the children of Kobani. She's a children's rights activist. They found, you know, things on her cell phone, um, you know, jokes that are available on all cell, cell phones based on the applications that you might download as well as songs by Shahi Najafi. There's not one Iranian in the world that doesn't listen to Shahi Najafi. And she's been accused of insulting the leader of the Islamic regime of Iran. Which is rubbish. Time. That's not what she's done. She's defended children's rights. And national she, security. That's the other thing security. they've, they've accused her of undermining national security. And, and that's the thing, you know, to defend children's rights is an affront to national security, according to them. You know, these are heroes in Iranian society, people who are defending the rights of people. They are in prison whilst, you know, officials of the regime are given red carpet treatment in other countries. Absolutely. And so we urge you to support the campaign for Atana Daemi's freedom. Uh, she should be released immediately. And this, she hasn't done anything wrong. She hasn't this done this anything is a plight wrong. of a lot of act, act, activists and the rights activists in Iran. And we, she needs to be freed immediately. There's no reason why she should be in jail. We're going to give you some information at the bottom of the screen so that you will know how to stand up and defend her. Uh, something we all need to do. We've got a new segment for you and it's called The Slice of Life and in it we're going to bring you photos, books, clips of anything that we think really represents the week that passed. And for us it is a photo of a, a retired man, pensioner. pensioner, sitting on the floor in front of a bank crying and in, it's in a Greece. really heartbreaking photo. Obviously, you know, he's lost everything. Um, and it's just a photo of the effects of austerity on people in Greece and everywhere. And you'll see him actually lost all hope. Uh, and, and they are the same sort of group of people in a queue. So that is very much related to uh, the situation in Greece. And these, this is why people are protesting. Exactly. Is, and and that, sh that picture, this picture and the face of this gentleman says a million things. It says it justifies the protest in Greece and the case that IMF and European banks are, what they're doing, it's wrong. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, again, this, this photo does speak a million words. I mean, I don't think any, any words can, can explain uh, the despair and hopelessness that a lot of people face. But on the other hand, you know, the wonderful thing is that the, the people in Greece and the protests have actually given hope to lots of people facing austerity, facing this sort of despair and poverty and hopelessness in many countries across the world. So, you know, solidarity with the people of Greece and uh, hoping that, you know, um, we will see some real change as a result of these protests. Now, Good news this week, it's from Iran again. Uh, Sohail Arabi, who was about to be executed, his execution has been cancelled. Yes, excellent. I mean, he's uh, the young man who had been accused of insulting uh, Muhammad, Islam's prophet, insulting Khamenei and other officials of the regime for things he had written on Facebook and, and so on and so forth. So thankfully, his execution sentence has been cancelled. He's not safe completely yet. So, you know, this is something that we but need to continue protesting I think the, the on. The pressure is so, the, the, the pressure, uh, you know, and the campaign, I mean, we, we did raise this case in Bread and Roses and many other uh, organizations, Amnesty International, international campaign against execution in Iran. We you know, had this campaign. They all worked really, really hard to put pressure on the Islamic regime to um, stop execution specifically about his case and that has given result and this is a brilliant news for everybody and particularly the family. Yeah definitely I mean so this is great news well done everyone for protesting and raising your your voices against his execution. We do have another bit of good news though and that is that Saudi women are now in some situations allowed to drive. Take a look.
Now, of course, it's the holy month of Ramadan. Not and very so, holy, is it? Yeah, so we're basically um, doing a couple of specials on it, including drinking wine, as we did last uh, week. Um, and now we're going to tell you some of the really funny Ramadan jokes that are coming out of Iran. Uh, so one of them says, in the past, whenever someone uh, wasn't fasting, they had to go into the corner and eat something so that no one else sees them. Today, whoever is fasting has to go in the corner so that they don't bother everybody else. Who's eating. Ha, ha. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's they a get good, it. You don't need to explain yeah, yeah, okay. it. It's a joke. Yeah. The, other, the other one is that the, uh, month, uh, they say the month, month of Ramadan is, the, is 30 days of acting on the stage of God. Just acting and pretending. <laughs> that's a good one. And there's another one which talks about Ghazanfar, who's like a doofus, <laughs> Iranian okay. doofus character and he says god can't you make ramadan like the olympics where it happens only every four years and that too in different countries yeah and the, uh, and drawing. he again um, <laughs> it, it said that he's actually he, he fasts but he doesn't half half an hour before the official time he starts eating and people come to him and say, Look, this is not on void so this doesn't work he said look i want to prove to god that i can actually fast but i'm not doing it <laughs> <laughs> That's a good one. And those are the Ramadan jokes coming from Bread and Roses to you. Question of the week is from one of our lovely viewers, Tayebe, who asks why we've called our program Bread and Roses. And the title Bread and Roses comes from a 1912 March 1912, textile, women textile workers march and strike. And this became the slogan of their protest because it basically means that we want bread, obviously, we want to be able to live, but we also want beauty and happiness and love, which is symbolized by yeah, roses. We fight for a better life. So we want bread and naturally for everybody a better life, but we want it with roses. Yeah. We want, you know, that's just combined. You can't just have bread or roses. You've got to have it together. Definitely. Yes. So that's the uh, reason behind this name. It represents, um, it's, I think it's significant. Um, and it's become, you know, one of the rallying cries of the labor movement as well and it continues to be so. Uh, there's a lovely film uh, called Pride where gay rights activists go to support the miners yes. uh, in their strike and in one scene uh, a woman gets up and sings this song. So if we're allowed to show it, we'll show it for you. Uh, if, if, and also we'd like to show you a little clip of Dan Barker who's the head of Freedom From Religion Foundation who I, I saw earlier at a conference in Germany and he played a bit of this uh, song for us as well. So we'll show you both of those clips if we can. Well, that brings us to the end of the, the program. To the end, yeah. Are you, gonna, are you going to mention the uh, fundraising campaign? Yeah. As you know, we've got a Patreon fundraising campaign. We have 18 beautiful funders. We love you. Keep funding us, keep telling people about us, distribute our programs. This is one of the things Reza Moradi, our director, is asking is that we need help in distribution one level it's being shown by a satellite new channel tv in iran on the other level we want to have much more widespread reach via youtube the good news is that on youtube actually in the top five countries uh, it includes saudi arabia egypt and indonesia so that's great uh, you know and and the other wonderful thing is that the program we did on the Turkish atheists has now been translated into Turkish and that's being spread in Turkey as Brilliant. well. So, so carry on doing that sort of thing, helping us get our word out. This brings us to the end of the program. Yeah. We'll leave you with a piece of music from Dan Barker. And also hopefully the um, song itself, which is beautiful. Bye.
I'm Mariam Namazi. And I'm Fadi Bospuya. We're hosting a program called Bread and Roses. It's a weekly program that's broadcast in Persian and English in the Middle East and North Africa, primarily Iran as well. And it's also shown on YouTube internationally. And we've been doing this since last May. We're coming up to a year's anniversary and yeah. we, we've had quite a lot of fun making these videos. We discuss taboo breaking, free thinking ideas. The Islamic regime of Iran has called us immoral and corrupt. And that's why the, you need to support us. We are and the vo alternative voice in Middle East and North Africa. Of corruption and immorality. So do support us. Here's a short video from Patreon that explains how you can help us with even just one dollar a week. That's nothing. Support us. Patreon lets fans become patrons of their favorite artists and content creators. It's different than Kickstarter because it's not about one big project that requires lots of funding. It's more for bloggers or YouTubers or webcomics, anyone who creates on a regular basis. Here's how it works. When you become a patron, you're agreeing to give an artist a tip of an amount you set every time they release a piece of content, whether it's a new song, a video, or a recipe. You can set a monthly maximum to make sure that you're always within your budget. Choose an amount, enter your payment information, and you're done. Becoming a patron allows you to view and post in the artist's stream, and in exchange for your support, artists offer additional patron packages, which might include monthly Google Hangouts, music production tutorials, pre-sale concert tickets, or anything they can offer as a way to say thanks. Patreon, empowering a new generation of content creators.